My name is Jared Lettery and welcome to the AI Academy. Our next speaker is Dr. Eduardo Harrington. Uh, Eduardo finished his fellowship at UCSF and is now at the RPMG practice in the Bay Area, um, California. He has an MBA and has had a deep and lasting interest in AI. He recently hosted an ASRM webinar on this exact topic, hosting different speakers from industry and clinics. He's going to talk about a smartphone playing off a publication that he had. And if you, like I, believe that smartphones are the direction we're going to be heading in assisted reproductive technologies, he'll have some interesting comments and insights to share so that we can be informed about these options as we move forward. Hello, everybody. My name is Eduardo Harriton, and I'm going to be speaking today about smartphone apps, wearables, and ART, um, and just meeting patients' expectations. Um, some housekeeping items. I do not endorse any of the products that I will discuss today, and I'm an advisor to some of the companies, none of which I'm directly discussing, but some of which are tangentially related. Um, so today we'll talk about a couple of things. What's the problem that we're trying to solve with apps and wearables? What are some possible solutions to those problems? And then let's think a little bit about what the future might look like and uh, what some uh, implementation may be for these tools. So let's first think about the problem a little bit. Um, let's think about the population that we're serving. We are increasingly serving millennials. And I had to Google this, they're 26 to 41 year olds, so including myself, and then the first digital native generation. What does that mean? That means that my peers grew up with computers. We had them in our homes when we were kids. We grew up with smartphones as teenagers, and we spend the most hours on the phone of any generation. So we spend about 3.7 hours a day on average which makes it sadly 23% of our waking hours. 96% of us own a smartphone and 86% use social media. Uh, and then importantly, about half of us use a smartphone as our primary access point to the internet. So it does, you know, everybody's on the internet, but most people are accessing directly through their phones. And what does this mean? It means that we expect to be communicated with seamlessly, whether it's when we're ordering food, or when we're talking to friends or calling family or whatever it is, we wanna have that be a seamless, easy experience on our phone, because that's how we're used to communicating with others. What's the problem? The IVF workflow really hasn't changed in four years. This paper here on the right was a great piece by some of the leaders of our field that outlined how much we've improved since the first uh, IVF baby was born in 1978 in terms of our success rates and our ability to get people pregnant. But when you take a step back, the process looks pretty similar. You show up at a doctor's office, they talk to you for a given period of time, get a lot of information, they counsel you, then they send you on your way to get some tests, you come back, you look at those tests, and then you go through a process where you come back to the clinic multiple times, uh, and then have some sort of procedure, hopefully to help you get pregnant. So the actual backbone of IVF hasn't changed. Importantly, the way we communicate with patients often hasn't changed. We have messaging portals that are a little bit clunky. There's a lot of HIPAA regulations that create obstacles. So it's hard to iterate on the communication ways. And when you think of it at a clinic level, clinics are very good at serving patients. They're very good at taking care of individuals who need help. They're not set up to design fancy web-enabled apps that work on iOS and Google phones and et cetera. They're just, that's not what they do. So there has been limited innovation in this field coming from the provider side. What we really need is we need tech-enabled solutions to meet the patients where they are, and they are wanting to be communicated via apps and to have the rest of their ecosystem, which is often on their phones, match where they're getting their healthcare. And these solutions need to be scalable, they need to be easy to use, and they need to be affordable. So we'll jump into talking a little bit about apps, we'll talk about wearables, and then we'll talk about the role of AI and how that might impact um, some of this movement into the phones and, and communicating with patients in that way. So 
In terms of mobile applications, there have been extensive use of mobile applications through healthcare with promising results. And I just did a cursory search online, pulled out some papers, but you can see here, we've done it to treat depression, we've done it to improve hypertension adherence, we've done it to uh, look at weight loss. Some of these have been successful, some of these not so much, but the idea of using apps in healthcare to engage patients and improve their behaviors or improve how we serve them is not new and has been happening across healthcare. Infertility per se, for a lot of the proactive fertility users or people who wish to use birth control, mobile apps are widely, widely popular. I would say it is the exception to find a patient that doesn't pull up their phone to tell me how many uh, days happen within their periods, when they're having intercourse, more, more people are using their phones to track their cycles, track their fertility, um, and there's multiple apps that are able to do that, some that are very good and some that are not based on data and not so good at all. I did want to mention there's one app that's a, an FDA cleared birth control method called Natural Cycles, for example, with perfect use, they cite a 2% a failure rate and a 6.2% failure rate with typical use. And, you know, for some, that's not enough when you compare it to, for example, an IUD or an exponent. But when you compare it to condoms, which are the chosen way for a lot of people, it's a similar success rate um, in terms of uh, use and then a uh, much worse typical use rate. And I did flip it, so it should be 15% here, but you get the idea. It's pretty successful uh, at preventing pregnancy. And that's really unique and something that's new in the last few years. I also wanted to mention this study. This is a randomized control trial from Washington University where they looked for an, a, to see whether an app to manage medications during IVF was helpful. You know, in their study, they found that there were no significant differences uh, in medication errors, medication surplus, or patient-initiated messages. So they were seeking to make medication use safer, more efficient by having less left over and then less burdensome on the clinic staff. And they did not find that what that was the case. You know, below that, you can see a reflection that I wrote in Fertility and Sterility, where I said, I, I don't think we should give up on apps yet. Um, this study was of limited power. There was no IT integration. So when the patients were sent a message to the app, then they also got a call from the nurse, which is what the other arm did. Um, and it, they had to manually move the things over. So my argument is we don't need it to be better than human interaction. We need it to be at least the same. Uh, because that means that it's going to be more efficient. And that means that instead of making phone calls to say, hey, let's go up on your dose, let's go down on your dose, come back tomorrow, we're sending messages. So that nurse now has more time to dedicate to other patient aspects that are a little bit more value add. We still need to study this and make sure that, that this is the case. Safety should always be the most important part, but I think there's an opportunity to use applications in the management of medications and other areas of fertility, which I'll touch on, in order to improve IVF outcomes and the patient experience. I also wanted to touch on uh, the mental health burden of fertility. Um, over half of women with infertility have scored in the clinical range for depression and over three quarters for anxiety. This was a study that came out of our group uh, by Dr. Laurie Pash at UCSF um, a couple of years ago. And that is a lot of people. Um, as I mentioned before, there are some apps that focus on mental health and there is some good preliminary data that app-based counseling is effective. As you may or may not know, there is a dearth of mental health providers and the ones that we have are extremely overworked and overburdened. Because if you think about it, if three quarters of the patients or half of the patients that come into our clinic need to be seen and you have 10 doctors and one or two psychologists, if any, those are the clinics that have some often they just ask people to find their own psychologist or go elsewhere, there's going to definitely be an unmet need to deal with the mental health um, implications and, and the correlated diseases that we have. So apps present a very interesting opportunity to scale some of that support. And while for some patients that is not sufficient, and we certainly have to get 
um, get training and get good at triaging, who needs to be seen in person versus not, we do have an opportunity to incorporate a lot of these uh, app-based or web-based methods to help support our patients um, through, the, through the fertility journey. I will say that a lot of these companies are trying to do research to understand how their apps or their programs are helping patients. And I think that's the right approach. You certainly want to be able to show that it works before you deploy it broadly. So I, I support the research endeavors that a lot of these companies are doing. And I encourage those companies who are just trying to get to market as quickly as possible to take a pause and make sure that they're validating their approach. I then want to jump into wearables. Um, here are some different companies that have everything from bracelets to wands to pee sticks and, and all kinds of different ways to measure your fertility. Why do we care about wearables? Because wearables have the ability to interact with patients at multiple points every day or every hour or every minute. So they have the ability to collect a lot more data. As a physician, in the best case scenario, during a IVF cycle or a given month, I'm going to see my patient once, a couple of times, maybe 10 days out of a month, but I'm not with them every day. I'm not able to capture data all the time. And I think the idea of a wearable that's able to constantly monitor temperature, hormones is very promising for two reasons. Number one, it gives you a much deeper view as to what's happening with patients on a minute to minute or day by day basis, but it also creates a repertoire of data that can help us understand the patient much better. We can all think back to the studies in the 60s and 70s where the patients were getting blood draws every hour or every couple of hours to understand how hormone fluctuation around ovulation happened, uh, but those studies are not done anymore. So using wearables to measure some of these hormones or measure temperature or measure different um, variables that the, the patient uh, may be able to provide to some of these devices is really interesting in furthering our understanding of the biological sciences, but also then mining that data to drive insights that are useful for the patients. Some of these companies are doing some studies that are very interesting, but others have limited data on effectiveness and have gone to market. So patients are left trying to decide which devices work and which devices do not work. So again, I think it's important to validate this upfront. And lastly, these are quite expensive. You know, some of them are, you know, 50, hundred dollars, but some of them are two, three, four hundred dollars for a device. And a lot of them have you know, kind of like a razor, razor blade model where you have to continue to buy test strips or whatever else to continue to use it. And they can get quite costly. Certainly something that's totally fine if the patient's driving value, um, especially because sometimes the alternatives are very expensive testing or treatments. That being said, before patients are exposed to paying this cost, I think it's really important to make sure that the results are validated externally and that patients are getting what they think they are getting. This is just another example. So this is an aura ring and they are doing very interesting studies looking at fertility where they're trying to understand you know, ovulation and what they can gather from their biometric data in order to help guide patients. I also wanted to talk a little bit about artificial intelligence and the fact that we are poised to use machine learning and AI to increase, uh, make better decisions in IVF. I think initially a lot of these decisions will be assisting providers, but I think that over time, my expectations is that some of these decisions will become a bit more automated and perhaps made independently by an AI that's well validated and that we feel comfortable with. You know, I wanted to touch on a few of these papers. Um, the first one is a, patient, a paper by uh, Dr. Lettery that looked at a computer decision support system to help manage IVF stimulation. And it was one of the first papers that actually looked at whether the AI could mimic physicians. The second paper is our paper that me and my colleagues did at UCSF, where we used a machine learning algorithm not only to mimic what doctors did, but to improve on that decision to try to optimize fertilization outcomes. 
And then the third paper is a gr uh, group out of Mass General that I work with, where we were trying to use a uh, machine learning to select the best embryos. I would say that these are just three tidbits of uh, the process that you can focus on, but you could use AI to make better outcome predictions in IVF. So pre-stimulation to help the patient understand what their odds are, and then post-stimulation to help the patient understand what their odds of pregnancy are based on a given outcome. You can use machine learning to understand the optimal protocol for the patient, if there is one, and then what the optimal dose would be. And if there's not, what the lowest dose would be that would achieve the same outcome without exposing them to increased cost of medication. Um, you can help make intracycle decisions, like whether we should change the dose, when the patient should come back. Um, like in our paper, when you should trigger, what you should trigger with. And then in the embryology lab, help decide which embryo to transfer. And if people are not making embryos and are making eggs, for example, you could help them understand what are the chances that those eggs will make embryos and babies down the line and make that a little bit more personalized than just saying, oh, you're 37 years old. On average, for all comers, this is your probability. I think when you think of how this might happen, I think a tech-enabled implementation is key. So this should not be something that the physician has to go in, plug in some numbers into an Excel sheet and get an output. This We should be thinking of designing software where if an AI is going to make these decisions and suggest these decisions for patients, then we are able to um, basically get the patients the answer without having to go through a physician. Again, it needs to be well validated and we need to feel comfortable, but I think we're gonna get there in the no so distant future. So in summer, the data is promising, but it's pretty early in the space and we need high quality studies to proceed clinical implementation to make sure that we're only uh, offering patients things that are standard of care and that the high quality and the good outcomes that we've gotten to are not only sustained, but hopefully down the line improved by the application of machine learning and some of these other um, technologies like apps and wearables. Um, so let's think a little bit and let's reimagine the fertility experience. This is what I like to do uh, at the end of the day um, after a long day of patience is just think, how can we make this better for the patient, both from an experience standpoint and from an outcome standpoint? So I think we can use some of the things that we talked about to give patients proactive fertility education. You shouldn't learn about your fertility, about the age-related fertility decline when you are having a problem after 12 months of trying. You should be educated throughout your life when you're not trying to understand what you can expect with your fertility. When you come to clinics, uh, if you're tracking your periods, if you've had ovarian reserve testing at some point, if you've had any other sort of pertinent history, that should be integrated into a smart intake uh, that can take all of that data, either from an app or from your intake, and provide that to a physician in a way where before seeing you, the physician already knows what to expect. I think one of my biggest pet peeves is I have the most time to spend with a patient in our first visit, but that is the time that I have the least information about them. So yes, there is something to be said about taking a thorough history, but if I already had some data from my patient, whether it is because my smart intake said, hey, they need to redo these labs or they're missing this test, I could use that time more effectively to actually counsel them on things that are more pertinent to them rather than the, if your partner has sperm, we might uh, do IUI. If your partner has low sperm or no sperm, we might need to do IVF or these are other options. So it helps the experience be more targeted and that visit be uh, more well-received. I think as we think of AI decision support-based systems, we will be able to not only make better decisions during stimulation, but if there's no better decision to be made, we will be able to automate some of these decisions. We'll give some time back to our clinicians so that rather than standing in front of a computer making decisions, they will be face to face with patients, spending time and deepening those relationships. I think it's also an opportunity, whether it is before, during, or after a, an ART treatment, to incorporate data from wearables or apps that they're using in order to help make better decisions for themselves. Again, as physicians, we only get 
you know, one hour snapshots of someone's life when they come, they get blood work and an ultrasound. But if we are looking at um, looking at devices that are monitoring them in and out, especially if they're monitoring hormones or perhaps doing ultrasounds at home, which is another trend that's rising, we will have a much better, deeper and comprehensive picture of what's going on uh, with their fertility. And we will be able to hopefully use those insights to drive better decisions. And then lastly, I do really feel that app-based seamless communication is what people want and need. There is no reason why in the 21st century, our nurses are playing phone tag with patients to tell them that they should drop this dose or they should do that. A lot of people use portals, but I don't see why we couldn't have a system where when that decision is made by the physician or maybe eventually the AI, the patient gets a notification of their phone and they have to acknowledge that they received it. They can then use the same app to say, I gave myself the medication, check, check. There's instructions there where the patient can go step by step and acknowledge that they've done it. It's great for research on medication adherence and it will save a lot of time and money. So when we think about we don't have enough doctors or nurses to handle the demand of fertility patients that exist, I think thinking about how do we leverage technology to give time back to those people so that we can either help more patients or help patients more cheaply so that we can increase access to care is really, really important. And it's honestly the future of our field. So that's all I got for you all today. My email's here. Feel free to contact me anytime if I can be helpful. My Instagram's there as well. And I'm happy to talk to any of you about any of this. Thank you so much and have a great rest of your day. Thank you for listening. Uh, Eduardo um, could not be with us for discussion further today, um, but we can open this up for some discussion and questions. Um, one question came up about whether or not these wearables are AI based, uh, not necessarily. And that's part of the problem is that the database and the reliability of a lot of these wearables is open to question. Uh, I thought Eduardo's talk was spot on and excellent. And um, a couple of things came up uh, that for me drew, drew my attention. Um, this is a, a book by Eric Topol that you may know. Uh, Eric Topol is a uh, professor at Scripps Research in California. The title of this book is The Patient Will See You Now with a subtitle of The Future of Medicine is in Your Hands. Copyright of this book, first edition is 2015. So this is almost 10 years old. Dr. Topol has been working in this space for quite some time, putting forth these ideas of empowerment to patients. General medicine is his field but it applies especially to our demographic, as Eduardo pointed out at the start of this lecture. This is a group of patients who are going to demand communication and information through their phone. Uh, there's no, no question that we're going to have to communicate with them on their terms. Eduardo used the term uh, digital native, which he is given his demographic. For many of us on this call, we're, we're, we're considered um, digital immigrants and that we've learned this as we've moved forward. Many of us did not grow up with smartphones. Uh, we were paper, paper and pencil. Uh, this is all transitioning to the owners of the smartphones. We're going to have to meet them on their grounds. I'll mention one other thing um, that I think is significant. I think we should redefine outcomes. We've been focused on outcomes as improved pregnancy rates, and that's all absolutely appropriate. But there's another aspect to a lot of these tools and it's the patient experience from the patient perspective and the workflow from the clinic's perspective. The patient experience, as I mentioned a moment ago and as Eduardo pointed out, is all about communication in a way that's efficient. Getting phone calls from patients, at least in the Seattle area for our clinic, is history. Patients don't wanna be called, they're in meetings, they want text information that they can act on and access at their leisure. And from the clinical standpoint, outcomes should be redefined to include not only pregnancy rate, that is the holy grail, but um, other aspects of the clinic, such as workflow, minimizing the amount of time nurses have to spend calling patients back, making sure that there's a level loading of the embryology uh, team so that they're not getting 15 retrievals today and two tomorrow, 
All of this can be enabled um, with a lot of the AI that Eduardo touched on. And I'll stop there. Um, and I appreciate all of your attention. Um, happy to take any questions. Uh, my email is my name, jared.lettery at Seattle Fertility. If you have any questions, feel free to email me. Uh, Eduardo, uh, excellent lecture, spot on. And thanks so much to each of you.